Thank you. voices matter, that, that the content of their heads and of their hearts really matter, and giving them a platform and a, and a, and a way for them to explore that and to bring it forth. And, um, you know, I, I, there's just this juxtaposition of two familiar images and then two very dissimilar images. When you think of um, Jerome's high school picture, it's not even high school, it's probably elementary school, and then when you see Kalima's elementary school picture, that is the same child in America. You can go into any school in this neighborhood or any, Ameri any, any neighborhood in this country and you will see those two children. They are, they, this is not you know, 20 years ago, this is today. And so what those two children become is up to everybody in this room and up to everybody in this country to let one outcome come forward or unfortunately leave these kids behind and let that other outcome much too often be, be uh, what, what we see. And so just so inspired to have you here and Kelly and everyone. people here who have been supporting me for a few years, in, including Margie and Nate Thorne, and Derek Beecham, who just moved to New York, so give him um, a little support and meet him. So, he has new, awesome job. Um, so what, we were going to have the um, students show their apps real quick, uh, quickly, um, five minutes they have, just to show you what they've actually developed, because sometimes seeing it is um, tells you as much as the film. Before we have them come up, I just want to say thank you to everyone, and thank you to Coralie and Dennis Paul, um, and what a beautiful talk you just gave. Um, what you guys are doing is what gives a voice to independent filmmakers like me. Um, as Dennis mentioned, I have quite a background before I became a filmmaker, and then I decided to launch Loudspeaker Films with the concept of putting different voices on the loudspeaker that we are not hearing enough. So we do online interviews, and I'm doing the short films, and eventually I want to do feature-length films. I think the first one should probably be about Kalima's life, because we really just dip into it here, and there's so much, and it, you're such an inspiration. Um, so thank you, Reactive Film. Thank you guys for starting, and to Belia Graham and Jackie Northaker for organizing this tonight. And thank you, Jarrell Bradford, who is going to be a speaker tonight, um, of New York Can, um, because unfortunately, Denmark West is running late. We'll see where we get, and he may still make it. Um, but first, I'm going to hand it over to these two incredibly talented kids, and also tell you that Zachary is actually in an MSNBC special video that's online. They did a segment on him. Um, in Philadelphia, which we filmed, but it's, it, it's not in this film. It's going to be a new video online soon. Um, and Victoria, I met her through watching the film and seeing what she was doing, and I'll just let them show you. <laughs> all right, first of all, how is everyone doing tonight? All right, well, my app is called Recupery, and it's mainly a, men a mental wellness app. So this is the typical user that will be using Recupery, and this is the story of John. John is a 16-year-old young man who lives in a constant state of distress. John wants to be a pediatrician. However, he's not motivated. He's getting bad grades and has a poor relationship with his mother. He doesn't have many friends. Well, this is John's story. This is the story of many of America's teens today. They live their daily lives fighting battles that they think they must fight alone. And we want to end that today with Recupery. Recupery is a mobile app that can provide an easy gateway for children and adolescents to receive psychological help via video call, phone call, or SMS messaging. Along with the clinical support provided, Recupery will also host a wellness community for teens. And I want to say something really fast. Um, what drives me behind this application is that August 27, 2012, I lost my mother to lupus and kidney failure. And after that, it was probably the darkest time in my life, and I started to feel what depression and anxiety felt like for the very first time in my life. And me personally, I don't want people my age to go through what I went through. It's as simple as that. I can't stress it enough. I don't want them to go through that because it's really not a good mental state to be in. So that's really why I want to develop this application. Why recuperate? According to the National Institute, Institute of Mental Health, about 11% of adolescents have a depressive disorder by age 18, and girls are more likely than boys to experience depression. 
According to the World Health Organization, major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability among Americans age 15 to 44. Clearly, there, there are many teens and mental or emotional crisis. This app is not only for the owner, but as a support for friends and family members as well. The following sites were chosen as they have strong teen interaction. I mean, let's be honest, every teenager in the world uses a social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. Google AdWords, Google AdWords will be used by the team to optimize searches performed by teens who are using Google for help regarding depression. Mental health professionals, self-help self, self -help authors, mental health organizations, and hospitals would buy ad space to market their support materials slash networks to families in crisis. We would also solicit government funding to support this healthy initiative. In closing, this service is designed to provide clinical support and community support to teens who find themselves in mental or emotional crisis. My name is Victoria Pinnell. I am 15 years old. I am an activist and when I was 13 years old, I made it my lifelong goal to um, end child sex trafficking. Monica's story. So when I was 13 years old, I participated in a public service announcement um, portraying a girl who was 13 years old. Her name was Monica. And she had been sold by her father into the sex trade at the age of 13. Monica is now 15 years old. True story. She's 15 years old and she has two children and she doesn't know who um, the parents, who the father is. Um, this is a problem and sex trafficking must end. Sex trafficking is a $32 billion annual industry and almost 18,000 people are trafficked in the United States each year. The average age of someone who enters the sex trade is 13 years old. So, because of this, I created the STOP app. What is STOP? STOP stands for Sex Trafficking Operations Prevention App. STOP is a platform that empowers all of us to blow the whistle on the atrocities of child sex trafficking in our communities. So, the first feature of the STOP app is the I Need Help button. This allows anyone who is being sexually trafficked or who is in danger to be able to call the National Hotline for Human Trafficking, which is 1-888-3737-888 and they will be allowed to get the help that they need with one click of a button. The second feature, feature excuse me, is I am a witness. Now this allows you, being a witness, if you think you see um, someone participating in sex trafficking, a pimp or a victim, you will be allowed to write a description, um, what they look like, the eye color, the hair color, um, and automatically it will be sent um, to a poli either a police database, um, and it'll be able to just help you, and it'll let you know, it'll notify you if you need any help with anything. Um, the third feature is I want more information. This feature allows you to get all the information, the statistics on sex trafficking. It lets you know what to look for. So if you're going down the street, you know what to look for. You know what sex trafficking looks like because a lot of people do not know about child sex trafficking. Why stop? We want to be able to increase awareness about the epidemic of child sex trafficking. We want to dec decrease the chances of being sexually trafficked. We want to help victims recover and get they help the help they need with the resource page. Both witnesses and victims can contact Polaris Project from within the app. And 93% of the people we interviewed at the New Orleans Hackathon would download and use this app. Our action partners are DontSellBodies.org. Um, three Years of Hope, Polaris Project, and the Global Slavery Index. This was a picture from when I did the public service announcement. And this is Sex Trafficking Operations Prevention Act. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe we can start there because New York uh, CAM, NY CAM, uh, is one of our partners tonight in bringing you all here. So maybe you can just start by telling us a couple words about NY CAM. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Uh, I, I was joked that I can is more like I can or me can. Uh, <laughs> but we are a, um, a state-based nonprofit and a network of seven state-based nonprofits working on um, change in the education reform advocacy space. 
So uh, I'm a great supporter of charter schools and school choice, and I work on teacher evaluation and tax credits and all these other kinds of things. Um, and I think much, much like your story, I'm deeply personally driven um, by this because when I was a kid growing up in Southwest Baltimore, I won the lottery and I got into a school I never would have gone to. Um, and I know that the life that I live today is solely because that happened to me. Um, not because I was any smarter or any better than the kid who was right next to me or right across the street from me. Um, and the fact that those opportunities are so uh, sparse is working precisely as intended. Um, that is the, the rational byproduct of a system that assigns you know, in, inequitable opportunities in education based on who your parents are, what color their skin is, how much money they make, or which a zip code is. Um, and I can uh, works to, to change that. And I can work to change that. So I'm <laughs> delighted to be here with you guys. I've known Kelly for a long time, too. Fantastic. So Kelly, a lot of people here, a lot of people here might not be familiar with the Teach series. And you know, when you, I'd love for you just to talk a couple of moments about the series, but also, you know, how did you find, uh, how did you find Kalima? How, did, how were you introduced to him, and, and how did you make that the subject of uh, Code Open? Um, well, I'll start with the first question. Teach um, is basically 20, my 20 plus years of working in urban America in schools and education policy, um, and having a lot of relationships with kids, including my now um, unofficially official daughter, <laughs> Janae, who's in college. And seeing so many students of mine um, from when I was teaching in South Central and others I worked with in DC and elsewhere, um, following that path to prison instead of following what their brains would like them to follow and what they could follow and their potential. Everything we're talking about tonight has to do with potential. He said it so well before. That potential is right there, right now. What are we going to do about it? When I decided to start making this, when I started to make um, the films, I decided to call them Teached um, because the idea is kids are going to school, but they're not being taught. How are we doing that? How are we continuing to do that? How are we having that conversation and the conversation of over-incarceration? Again, still, decades. We've been having these conversations for a while, and it feels almost like we're back in the civil rights era. Again, fighting the same battles. You know, everyone in this room is familiar with that. Um, I decided to do short films so that you could have conversations around the films, and also when you show them online, um, you can get a much bigger audience that way. So it's a bit more difficult in some ways to do short films because you don't have a regular theater um, cinematic release, but I think it's working pretty well to have short films. Kalima um, appeared before me from, like most great things. It's um, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and honestly, I, I want to do a feature-length film about Kalima. We have a lot of the footage already, and we're just looking for people to, to back that project. I'm ready to make it. Um, because there's so much more to the story that we, we can go into in this short film. And the coding itself is a story that's so fantastic and um, timely. Um, someone introduced me to Kalima for another reason. And we had a Skype interview. And at the end of it, I said, sort of jokingly, has anyone made a film about you? And he said, no. And I was, oh, they should. And I think it was two or three weeks later, I woke up and went, I'm making that film <laughs> today. <laughs> so I want to dig into a little bit of that. So you, you, end, you, you get to Oakland from Brooklyn, from New York. And that is when? What year? When did you get there? Uh, that was 2010, July 8, 2010. It was on my birthday. Okay, and how long did it take you to realize that the community needed, needed this? I mean, you told the ICE story, um, but at what point did you go beyond helping kids get ICEs and, uh, and, and get them into the, and get them into your program? Uh, from 2010 to the beginning, how, how long was that and how did it start? Well, uh, well, well first, um, uh, in order for me to focus on your question, uh, <laughs> There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a looming question in my mind, which is, Zachary, is that a mustache? Is, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> finally noticed. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's an inside joke here, I think. <laughs> so, um, but as an educator, as a teacher, you notice those things. You know, you notice whether they've grown an inch. You notice, um, uh, you know, the, the, the new haircut style. You notice, uh, you know, the way that they're wearing their hair. I mean, you notice all the little things, and... When I got off the plane, 
uh, in Oakland, I immediately noticed that there was a a a a a, a, a lack of leadership. It was immediate, and uh, and in the place I stayed at, I would uh, immediately visit the schools. Whenever I go on, I, I, I rarely go on vacations. Whenever I go uh, uh, abroad, I usually visit the school. So, uh, so recently I was in Mumbai, and I immediately went to the schools there just to talk to the principals, talk to the to teachers, you know, talk to the kids. Uh, and so the same, I did the same thing when I went to Oakland. I, I talked to the school leaders, teachers, kids, and uh, and I just realized that there was just a lack of leadership. Were you teaching in the school at that time? Were you? I was uh, particip participating in a program called Citizen Schools. Not sure. And um, and uh, through Citizen Schools, I was teaching a rapid prototyping class. Um, and uh, and I'll never forget this. The, this. the second class I taught was how to hack, and uh, and that got. Uh, a lot of teachers uh, came into the room just to see what I was going to do, and, uh, and it was pretty awesome because the, because the, the, the firewalls didn't allow the kids to use Twitter, so they used LinkedIn's uh, Twitter API in order to tweet, and so uh, and, and those kind of things we taught them. And so now from what you did from what you did in Oakland to what you did in New Orleans, have there been other hackathons since? Is there a plan? Have you? Do you now have backing from Coca-Cola? Is, is there a big sponsor behind you that's taking taking this forward and there's going to be a whole series of hackathons? Or where are you in that process? Well, uh, when I, uh, I I came in and and I remember uh, watching the, the previous documentary, The Path to Prison, and when I look at the, when, I, when I look at that story and I think about prison and growing up in a group home, and that was another type of prison. It, the problem that I, I believe is in, in America is that we're so privileged as a country, as a nation, that we don't realize that we're still in prison. That, I mean, it could be a well-decorated prison. Your prison could have a BMW. Your prison can have all the food in the world. But we're still in prison. And one of the biggest prisons that we can be in is in our minds. And for a lot of these young people, uh, they're on their phones, they're on their devices, and yet they're still in some way in a prison. And right now, Silicon Valley is in their own prison. They don't realize the kind of talent that is out there that needs to be cultivated at a very early stage, very early engagement in East Palo Alto, in Oakland. And, and, and trying to get not only Silicon Valley on board, but major corporations. Have them see that, hey, you know, diversity, inclusion is not charity. Charity in the 20th century was about the redemption of the giver and not the liberation of the receiver. Mm -hmm. And so, so I tell them, look, this is the 21st century. The best thing you can do right now is to make a sound business decision about investing in talent development right here in your backyard. Because talent is becoming increasingly expensive, and also you don't want to tell the secrets of your company, show the secrets of your company to someone who can take it back abroad, uh, and then you have nothing to do, and there's nothing you can do in terms of IP protection. And so why not train these kids? You know, Zachary does not want to steal Google's secrets. Victoria does not want to steal Facebook secrets. They just want to get paid. They just want to go to college. They want to support their families. You know, uh, Victoria wants to buy her mom a house. Yes. You know, uh, <laughs> Zachary wants to buy, you know, buy, you know, wants to buy Michelle his his aunt two houses. Um, and it, I mean a Cadillac. I mean whatever. It, 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 but what it is is that they want to transform their lives. They want to be able to own their lives and their situations. And so I think that that's what we are at Kino are. That's what we. That's the conversation that we have with these companies. So, so fantastic. So you're taking this vision from the hackathons. You're going directly to corporations in Silicon Valley. You're making the case that this, again, it's not charity. This is investing in the future of your workforce and, and uh, also improving you know, not just the workforce for your, for your company, but for this community and for this country. It makes sense. And what kind of response are you having? Can you talk about maybe one of the companies or two of the companies? Are you having positive response? Do, you, do, you, do we need to help you with this? Or are you not needed? You don't seem like you need a lot of help. Have you already convinced them that, that this is, because it makes sense to me, but are they listening? Well, I, you know, I'm tired of them sending panic checks, which is uh, when, uh, then when some of their developers get into an argument and kick um, a, uh, a kid off of their own soccer field because they've rented the field for a couple hours, 
Um, and then and then suddenly they come to us and say, okay, oh, we write you a check and save, you know, save us, you know, in terms of our public relations uh, disaster. Uh, so yeah, once again, 20th century. Uh, then you've got the, oh, well, can we just give them basketballs? Maybe they'll be happy with jerseys with, the, with our company logo, you know. Where, once again, 20th century. The conversations that I tend to get uh, into is, 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 is twofold. One is with, with companies, organizations, foundations, um, they believe that the talent investment should be happening right when young people are graduating from, with their computer science degrees. Way too late. Way too late. And so that, does not, that doesn't do anything to um, create a pipeline. So, so is there any company that's, that, uh, that understand that these, this needs to happen younger? And is NTV doing this? Maybe that's a good segue. Is anyone jumping on board? Uh, well, I, 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 uh, Macy's just called. Uh, and so, so they're interested. Um, and, uh, but it's been an organization like the k Port Center for Social Impact. Okay. The San Francisco Foundation is very interested in us. Um, and so Essence, uh, we have a great relationship with Essence. They're they're phenomenal. Uh, and so there have been organizations uh, uh, and companies who have come on board to support this work. Uh, but you know, it's you know, it, I, I they don't they don't get it until they actually come to the hackathons and then they see the magic, they see the miracles. Mm -hmm. Got it. And Darnell, how is M has MTV? Uh, I know you're part of NYCAN, but have you shown this to MTV? Do you think that there's a role for you know, corporate America not? Through their nonprofit foundations, but you know, from a business standpoint, to get behind this kind of work and get engaged. Yeah. So, um, I, oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I just want I want to make two points about this. The first one is not directly on point. The second one will also not answer your question. Um, the the first thing is that like um, I just think it's really sort of I'm super supportive of what what you're doing because one of the great questions for me from a societal standpoint, societal change standpoint, is how do you get artists on the problem? Because in most, um, if you case study like how most things happen, where they transform the American psyche, there are two or three things that happen consistently in them. Um, celebrity is involved, um, youth is involved, and the last one is that there's a strong presence in the artistic community in either the form of music or film. So, you know, Four Dead in Ohio, right? I mean, like, how many people's minds does Cindy Portier change when he showed up and guess who's coming to dinner? That's real, right? And we're wired that way as a country to respond to those things. So, um, so I just sort of like want to commend what you're doing, and I want to flag that as a, as a shoot that I think we should continue to go down. The other thing I would say is that um, the, as much as it's important to have these people involved and realize that they need, that they need to be cultivating folks younger who, who are here sooner, the great thing about the, the world that is presented to us now is that it can happen without them. So there's, there's actually, I, I love giving this talk, a friend of mine gave me a hard time about this, um, but I give this talk about how Napster killed the record store, um, and then what happened after that. And the power of Napster was that like, there was nothing the record stores could do to make that happen, uh, to, to stop that from happening. And I look at like the App Store, or the Internet, or any of these sort of open platforms that we've created, and a hackathon, and I know that some kid there is gonna blow Google the hell up. It's just, it's just gonna happen. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a question of whether or not they ever ask or train the kid and bring them into the fold and do the right thing. It's just gonna happen. So like the the best thing about the disruptive technologies of the 21st century, I feel, is that like you better get with them or they will consume you, um, which is a huge advantage for our young people, assuming we give them the chance to be advantage. Very good. Very good point. Very good point. I mean, I think, I think, but I do think that it's important to build bridges and to build partnerships. I mean, I, as I saw both um, both apps that were presented, I thought of, you know, for example, uh, in the tech space in New York, I've met with a company recently that's working on their own app and has a lot of funding that's connected to mental health, not aimed at youth and not aimed at. Um, and not aimed at communities that you understand, but I think that would be an interesting conversation for you to have with them. And I'm sure Coralie was thinking also, uh, when Victoria was presenting her app, you know, we know a foundation in New York that's very involved in depression and helping, uh, sorry, that's very involved in, um, sorry, sex trafficking, um, and has been involved in a director who's made a film and other people. So I think, you know, not just 
the apps, they can be disruptive, and unfortunately they seem to be games that your kids buy, you know, spend money to... That's disruptive. I don't really get it. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be, you know, seems to be how everybody's making their money nowadays. Um, so I think, but sometimes these, these apps, as powerful and as intelligent as they are, sometimes need that connection to, to, to these entrepreneurs and these companies. This, they might be in Silicon Valley, they might be in Silicon Alley, but I think, you know, I wouldn't give up trying to get those companies to the table, not, you know, uh, not to support the program, but to connect with them. So. Well, there's another aspect to it, and that's how we structured uh, you know, Kino, and that is that, you know, I don't expect corporations or even foundations to save, you know, the human populace. You know, that's something that we have to do when we all start taking ownership and have and, and have accountability for each other. The person that's that's sitting next to you, and so when I was in a room, not with corporations, not with you know some of the major tech titans, uh, I was in a room with Jesse Jackson, and uh, several of the you would call them uh, the, the top black and brown elite uh, in Silicon Valley. Yeah, they have they have meetings, <laughs> and uh, for some reason they let me in that meeting, and and they were having this conversation about what would, they were going to do in order to create diversity along venture capital and creating access to capital. And this conversation went on for about two hours. Young people, children, education was not mentioned. And so here it is that, that there are people who are talking about diversity and inclusion and they're not talking about Zachary, they're not talking about Victoria. Because the fact remains is that their age is not that distant from, from a Mark Zuckerberg. But Mark Zuckerberg did not have to go to a school where there were body checks and metal detectors. And so the education system in our country is so far behind. What is it that we can do? And that's not something that I believe that, that, is, that, that corporations or foundations are going to solve. What is that we can do collectively in order to be able to, to open their doors, collapse those walls, and, and introduce them. Every one of us who has an office, we, there's an opportunity for us to have an apprentice, for us to have an intern. And so I believe that that's something that we all can take individually, and, and that's one of the things that with Kino was that we make sure that we are a very community-driven model. How, are, how do we get the corporations to support Kino Labs? <laughs> <That's my laughs> Here's the mic. Is she ready? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> or, or are they already? Is, I mean, you, you're at MTV, you were at Microsoft. Have you seen the kind of work that we're so excited about? Have, have I Kelly? seen it? Have oh, my seen, goodness. Have you seen that work? <laughs> being embraced by companies like MTV and Microsoft? So I think that there are two separate questions. One is, have I seen it being embraced by corporations, in which case I could say uh, for the Essence Festival where my, my, my now friend, Kalima, was kind enough to allow me to participate in the, the genius of bringing together uh, a technology event during the summer at a music event <laughs> for kids. And, and that would be a smashing success, completely reoriented my worldview. Um, but, you know, between the media companies like Essence and MSNBC, uh, there were uh, a number of other companies who supported from, uh, I'd say, a sponsorship perspective. There's a number of people, a number of groups who are interested in helping. Uh, that's just historically. Moving forward, there's a number of groups, and particularly large corporations, uh, in part influenced by the efforts of people like Jesse Jackson, who Kaleem has mentioned, uh, who are looking to not only support, but actually invest. So you look at what Intel has talked about in the last month with $300 million that they're going to put into various forms of support and participation in this particular ecosystem, uh, from uh, advertising and awareness to actual investment. Uh, there's a full spectrum there. Uh, there are companies, there are groups both for-profit and not-for-profit, who are not only interested in this space, but have actually publicly stated that they're going to move forward in that space uh, with, with real effort and fervor. Now, that's not to say that I think that that's the rule, uh, but I do think that that is hopefully the trend. Because uh, we also have to remember that uh, up until two years ago, none of the technology companies actually released data about the composition of their employment either. Uh, but Google served in a leadership role and said, hey, you know what? If we're going to preach transparency, we should start with ourselves. Let's actually reveal the way our composition works, and let's actually acknowledge that there's work that we have to do. Sorry, Kelly, I don't know if you had another question. Or... 
comments? Uh, no, I just yeah. want to make sure Denmark came to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that we, I'm um, glad that we got it. But, but I, I'd love to follow up with that and just uh, and, and ask again. So at MTV right now, um, what what can MTV do in particular to bring? Because you've got an IT department, you've got coders, you have people building apps. You have a, how do you bring in these kids into your community, your corporate community, not not waiting for anybody else right now? So just as a point of clarification, I, I haven't been in MTV for several years, <laughs> so uh, I am not empowered in any way to speak for them or on their behalf. Uh, I, now I will. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never let that stop me before. <laughs> so I can name a number of uh, hypothetical situations. What I'd say is on a concrete, specific, and today scenario, there's a relationship with a group called the Startup Box South Bronx that Majora Carter runs out of the South yeah. Bronx where uh, the Nickelodeon games team is actually working with people from the South Bronx that Majora is actually uh, mentoring and teaching how to code, uh, but focusing on QA and testing environments as opposed to actually game development, but it's an entry point into the ecosystem because it's an easier set of skills to learn, um, and Nickelodeon is actually using them for QA uh, as internships, which does two things. One is uh, it actually gives the kids something to strive for because they know how to play games, they know Nickelodeon's a brand, they, they recognize the value of uh, getting a chance to be early in the system because that's what this is. When you're testing, you're getting in early. Um, and it also provides uh, the, the opportunity for them to actually have work experience because this is actually something that serves as a uh, real job experience because that is a real job. On the Nickelodeon side, it, forms a form of outsourcing. Uh, they don't have to uh, pay as much for those services to interns as they would for full-time employees that would probably do a comparable level of job. Uh, but they're also giving, the, giving back to the community by giving people a chance that otherwise probably would not. Yeah, and hopefully those kids who have those experiences end up working at MTV or working somewhere else based on you know what they what they learn and what they put on their resume. So well, the, the benefit is if you think about it in terms of you know other sort of specific experiences, you think about what sponsors for educational opportunity did in finance mm -hmm. uh, by giving people uh, an opportunity to get into Wall Street and investment banking and other other jobs that have traditionally not been available. Um, they actually allow people who got a summer internship at J.P. Morgan to, you know, get out of school and then get a job at Goldman Sachs. The, the issue is that people who have work experience actually have flexibility. And the challenge is breaking into the system so that you can actually show that you have work experience. So I commend uh, my colleagues over at Nickelodeon for actually providing that opportunity to create that access point for people to actually demonstrate that work experience so they can actually get into the system and expand their horizons. Sorry, now I'm going to take questions because I know you all have questions. <laughs> or I'm going to keep asking and, and <laughs> dominating this, which I feel badly about. Questions? I'm his wife. I was the last. So I hear a lot about this as a pathway to employment. What about, is it also a pathway to entrepreneurship? Talk about that, would you please? Sure. So, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, one of the things that we do at, at, at Kino is that we look at what needs to happen now that we've created a favorable environment for accelerated learning. And so we look at our we look at a curriculum. And as a as an educator, I look at okay. So here are the things I learned in corporate America, like around pitching, branding. Uh, so so Victoria Pinnell is her own brand. Zachary Dorsonville is his own brand. And so we do a lot in terms of helping these kids understand the power of branding, understanding what it, what it is to, to create a product. But we also teach them some of the more technical skills like design thinking and rapid prototype development. And so being able to test ideas as quickly as possible, being able to look at how to solve a problem from different angles, like all those things help lead towards uh, a more entrepreneurial outlook. Uh, and so, and they, these are what we consider as 21st century skills, the skills that are not taught in the classroom. Because right now, if you talk STEM, a lot of, uh, of public organizations uh, will go, well, you know, there's a science fair that we're having, or there's this robotics competition. But they're not really teaching the 21st century skills that these kids 
uh, that these kids deserve in order to be able to go into any boardroom uh, for any tech, ti uh, tech titan and be able to say, hey, look, I've got this product and it needs to be in your hand. It's going to be the best thing that you ever had in your pocket. And I think that that's the thing that we most importantly impart with our kids. Yeah. Please. Uh, where's the VC world? Why aren't they crawling all over Oakland hackathon? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Maybe uh, uh, Denmark would uh, want to take that on as well. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's interesting. When I first moved to Oakland, there was this, and, and it, was the, the, it was the wife of the head of a big company, um, uh, uh, the head of their Asian Pacific uh, market. And, uh, and she said, she said, well, Kalima, you know, you've got education right, uh, but uh, you need to come to Silicon Valley and learn more about product development. And so that's why keynotes, there's our hackathons, we can send them products. And so, uh, and so I'm always thinking about shipping. I was thinking about what is it that we can do to get from uh, hackathon 2.0 to 2.2 to 2.3 and 3. Now, the interesting thing is that she says, in, in, in California, especially in the Bay Area, they've got product development right. But education, uh -uh. And one of the reasons why is because it's hard you know, I remember the days of the NBA back when I was interested in basketball. Um, and, and Wait, you say you're not now? No, no, no I, I can tell who is what in basketball anymore. Oh, I can tutor you. <laughs> so Sorry. The Warriors are doing well. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons why I, I started tuning out was because I'll never forget when Magic Johnson, it was, you know, it was reported that he was HIV positive. And Team USA, when other teams were deciding that they weren't going to play basketball uh, 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 if he was on the court, uh, they said, well, okay, well, then we'll strike. We're not going to play basketball. And so a, a lot of them were that, that, that are legends, they were the grown-ups on the basketball court. And, and, and now you don't hear as much of the grow, about the grown-ups. And in Silicon Valley, they're, not, they're, they're venture capitalists. They're angel investors, they're very wealthy people, but how many of them are actually grown-ups? They would rather spend 50, 100,000 on a surfboard than they were able to, make, uh, than they were able to send a couple of kids to college. And so, so that's the thing that, that, that part of my work is being able to help them realize that, that, that it is, is that they, ha they have a responsibility, that they have an accountability, and I try to make it as fun um, and, uh, and sexy as possible to them. Uh, but I think that that's one of the, the, the barriers, is that it's difficult to, to persuade uh, those who don't want to grow up to be able to take that role, be able to say, I have an accountability, I have a responsibility. And I believe that New York has been one of the most fantastic uh, 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 cities for that. I mean, there's a reason why there, there are names for every street. The reason why there are names for something else is because um, I'll never forget, I mean, I'll close with this. I'll never forget um, when I got the uh, Black Belt Achievement uh, uh, Fellowship uh, with Eckering Green, and this is through the Open Society Foundations. And Open Society Foundations is led by someone who was very visionary who said, look, you know, I was a kid around uh, when the Nazis were taking over Europe, and potentially they could have taken over the world. And, and I saw how systematically they were imprisoning and incarcerating and changing laws that were heavily biased, and creating inequality. And so, so I believe that you know, I, I, there's something I can do with my money in order to help those who are going through the same process. And I believe that New York City, Chicago, a lot of, a lot, a lot of those cities have the strong tradition of being able to do that, being able to say, you know what, we realize what happened in Nazi Germany, and we don't want America to look like that. And, and Mitch K. Poor, Frida K. Poor Klein, uh, a lot of those who, who are sort of the, they're, they're the grown-ups, who, who have decided that they're going to actually spend some of their capital to, to invest in, uh, in, in, in these kids. And, and, I'm hoping, you know, and I'm working with them as well as with others with Denmark in order to get a lot of them uh, on, on board. Um, and actually, you reminded me of one, you know, this concept of why, why isn't the money following someone who's doing training kids basically for free and creating amazing things. 
Um, I think so many people, and having worked in the nonprofit world for so long too, you can talk the talk, but are you really doing this in your life? And they put profit first. And I've seen this a million times, and then the money goes towards, okay, well that's gonna make a profit, and then once I'm so wealthy, then I'm gonna do something good for others. When you could live your entire life doing good for others today, you can hire people that look differently. You can look at a resume and not choose Joe Smith over Javier uh, Serrano or some. I mean, we know that this is happening. There's an unconscious bias, and especially I think, you know, if, if you can get yourself to recognize that as someone who's white and understands it as well, then you can start to change the way you live your life as well. Um, it's the only way. I mean, we all have to see it and change how we act. And putting profit as number one motive is not going to get us there. Um, I, I often mention the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. She calls what's happening today. I mean, the number of U.S. citizens incarcerated today, most of them black male in disproportionate numbers, she calls that a silent holocaust. And you reminded me to say that again because we are living in a silent holocaust. If you are not going to recognize that and do something about it, you are allowing it to happen. Um, and that's why I'm so passionate about these issues. Um, and that's why it is my honor to get to put other voices on stage and not lose so many children and so many adults at the moment. Um, it is probably, it to me, is the greatest injustice happening in the United States, and it is the cause of many of our other issues here. Things need to change, obviously, in the educational system, but for special schools to start teaching um, students at a, at a younger age, um, what do you call it, career readiness skills, like there's a school, I forget, I think it's in Chicago, where there's a mechanic uh, course, like where there's a garage in the high school, and they go and they learn about how to repair a car, so that when they are 17, and if they don't go to college, because not everyone's going to go to college, they actually have something in their hands you know, a tool that they can use to, to get a job. So I, I think, for me, I think that's really, really important uh, direction that our educational system should go in. So what I'm interested in um, is, so they've got a garage, they've got supplies, why stop at repairing? Why can't they build cars? I don't know. But yeah, no, 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 I mean, that's what I'm saying. And I think that that's yeah. where, see, that's the Silicon Valley mindset, yeah. right? It's just like they're, you, you, these kids are, are taught to build machines that don't exist. And so, and I think that that's the kind of education that I'm really excited about with these kids. Now, what was the subset of career ready is within the universe of college ready. Mm -hmm. And most of the time these things are presented as either or, right? So it's like, oh, either a kid gets yeah, to be true, very hands-on and, or, you know, build a car or, or learn how to code or be a router jockey, whatever, or the kid goes to, to Harvard or whatever, that kind of thing. And I just, I'm only highlighting that because I think it's probably important for everybody who discusses um, like matriculating to the work world faster for a kid who um, you know maybe doesn't want to go to, to college that that kid a should be able to right uh, and that being able to doesn't inhibit in fact it expands the kid's ability to do something else so, so you know the, I talk about the isolation that a lot of uh, kids uh, uh, experience that I experience. Um, one of the biggest uh, prisons that, um, that sort of a, a mental construct for, for these kids is that society is saying that to be successful you have to either rock the mic or be like Mike. And that was a, that was a big push, especially in my, it was just be like Mike, be like Mike, be like Mike, or rock the mic. And that's the thing is just that when Nas goes into a recording studio, they're giving him the tools to be able to drop Illmatic, right? And so, and I think that that's, and, and, then, and, and then he talks about in his rap songs, just like Biggie said, it was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, Salt and Pepper, Heaven Deep. You know, and so he's already saying, I'm, 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 re I'm doing my research as to how I can be famous, as to how I can be a better rapper, you know, and I'm practicing. I, 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 and, and then he's, he's telling you exactly, uh, you know, Ludacris says that, you know, he's, he, he sold uh, an album, uh, CD, five, uh, $5 a pop out of, his, uh, out of his car, you know, three weeks later, I step out the swamps with ten and a half gators, you know, and so, and these kids, so they, they, they hear it all the time, how to become a successful rap artist. 
they can go watch ESPN and they see documentaries about how to become the next Michael Jordan, how to become the next Muhammad Ali, and that is practice, practice, practice. And so this is something that's constantly being drilled into them. But if you tell them, uh, if, they, if they say, I want to be a doctor, or, or, even, or even Zachary, when he approached a friend of mine, um, and, and he says, I want to be a computer engineer. You know, our response is, well, then go to college. And then what happens is that if they do make it to college, they realize that the, that, that, that the, the, the next Steve Jobs, or the next even Ben Carson, that they started way before college. Mm -hmm. And so the college application uh, for, uh, for Harvard or Princeton is, is made even better when you can say, yeah, I've already done five, ten apps. And, so, and I think that that's a me different message that we send to them. And, and I believe that they could be prepared to engage in the careers that they're excited about right now. And we need to prepare opportunities for them to be engaged in those careers right now. I know, but so you're, the students that come to your hacker hackathon. hackathon, do they come ready? Like, I mean, I would come and I would not know how to, you know, apart from sending emails and, you know, upload something. <laughs> like, I would not know anything. Do they come because they've already done, spent hours on the computer and they know? Probably a better way to characterize it is that it's not restricted to people who know. There are plenty of people who come who do know. It's not restricted to people who know. So there are people who come who have no knowledge or no prior knowledge of programming, computer science, et cetera, but they find a role on the team because there's multiple roles that people can play, and Kuma does a great job of explaining that to people when they come. Um, there is always somebody but do you actually the teach from like, do you actually teach from like step one? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, we had this uh, an interesting gentleman uh, uh, named Giovanni, and Giovanni was the uh, he was helping his uncle, who's uh, one of our photographers. This is for the Open Hackathon, and Giovanni, uh, you know, his uncle told me he said, you know, Giovanni, you know, he uh, I told him about the hackathon. He he said he he, he didn't he's not into that. That's not his thing. Uh, but I, I kind of want him to be around just to be see the positivity in the kids. So I said okay. And so when he told me that, I already had a strategy that, that Giovanni is going to be one of the superstars in the hackathon. Yeah. And I have a strategy for all the kids. And that's why I have them go through an application process where they submit a video stating why exactly is this hackathon experience important to them. And some of them say, well, you know, whatever, whatever their answer is, just the fact that I got them to record a video or they ask somebody to record a video. Or if they say that there's no one around that has a phone, I send one of my team members to go record a video. Just because, and so they are immediately, because that's the thing is that, yeah, they're building apps, but apps are their lower hanging fruit. What I really want them to do is hack their own isolation. And that's what happened during that, the course of the hackathon, is that I was, and I remember calling Giovanni out by his name in the audience for him to pitch. And he went up and he pitched, and he pitched, uh, 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 he pitched his idea, and then, and, and then he joined, and then he joined another team. Giovanni, at the end of the hackathon, was t it completely transformed. Completely transformed. So not only did he learn some rudimentary coding skills, design skills, how to pitch, and all these different things that we teach, uh, one of his mentors actually gave him a MacBook. Um, actually went to his Apple store and actually bought him a MacBook because he learned that Giovanni did not have a computer at home. Giovanni was, was completely transformed, and, and now we're working with uh, school systems in order to get him back into school and, and, and to, for him to feel better connected. And so that's a, so, so the hackathon is, is great. It's, it, a hackathon is this, an environment that we want to be the opposite of, of, of prisons. We want, to, we want them to feel less isolated when they come, they come in. So I'm a recent college grad, and I was just wondering, for the, obviously there's kids that will, um, that will want to go straight into the workforce, but the, to the kids that do go to college, do you ever feel like the cost of education in this country is like it's a mental barrier because they feel like they can't afford it and they don't want to go through the hassle and the pain of applying for a student loan and then owing hundreds of thousands of dollars to the government and Sally Mae. So do you ever feel like that's something for them that's like, you know, it's hard to get past that mentally? So I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to respond to this. Go for it. So um, there, uh, this is, so um, I was talking to somebody the other day about um, organizing um, high school course choice where um, colleges could compete virtually with high schools and the, uh, the difference in the price of the class could go to offset whatever unused credits for college existed when a kid graduated, right? Because um, I, I think, A, we, we just have an opportunity to unbundle these things in much more meaningful, customized ways. But B, 
education is a debt bubble, and it's ridiculous, right? And, and there are like two very specific ways that we, I mean, we blow up people's, it was three ways, not two ways. We blow up people's entire finances for their lives about the buying of education that is normally, that's supposed to be free, but that isn't. And the first time we blow you up is with a mortgage. Right? So you got a kid and they're four years old and you're like, oh, you know, I love living best time, but like this ain't working. So you bid yourself into the most expensive place you can possibly get into, the smallest apartment there, right? You buy this house, it's way more house than you can afford because you're trying to buy free school. And you got like a 30 year drag on your earnings as a result of that. That's one. The other one is the college debt bubble, which you mentioned. And I just want to qualify this. I have no data to back this up, but I'm going to assert it with authority. <laughs> so, so you got to get that out there. Um, so it is uh, my belief that uh, part of the reason why college is so expensive is because people know a high school diploma is no longer a reliable predictor of high school skill. And so if you are, uh, like, other than the fact that, That's you know. Very, very sad. It is, it is. Very other very than sad. the fact that lots of other people will pay for it and there's more debt available so you can charge more for it and it fills into the housing bubble and all this other stuff. If people know that a high school diploma is not looked seriously upon by an employer, then a college diploma is worth more. So they charge you more for it. And I just think the economics of this are devastating um, to our young people. They're devastating to our young families. And specifically in the latter case, our young families are devastating to our cities. Because those are the people that we need to actually stay in them. And instead, they flee to the suburbs to get on this hamster wheel. And it's deeply unfortunate. Excellent point. Denmark. Not quite as desperate, but definitely wanted to talk. <laughs> so CNN actually did a documentary on this called The Ivory Tower, which if yes. you haven't seen, yes. you should. That was our yeah, last great actor film screen. Well played. That was actually fortunate, right? <laughs> so obviously there's a significant number of people here who are familiar with it. I think that there were a few points in there that I thought were uh, particularly uh, insightful. Um, one was uh, student debt is one of the few forms of debt that stays with you through bankruptcy. Right. So it is not just uh, a debt bubble, it's a debt trap. Uh, it is one of the few things that you can't get rid of. And so your question about how people think about it, if you are aware of the fact that the debt that you take on actually is something you can never get rid of, then it probably is going to have a different calculus in terms of how you think about it. The second challenge is the unemployment rate for college grads is actually pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> so you take the first point and you combine it with the second point, and now I'm thinking even harder about this college equation. The third point that I thought was really interesting uh, that I actually didn't know is that the, the colleges are actually competing with each other on things that have nothing to do with education. And so the thing that actually causes the price of education to rise is like the new building they just built, or you know some landscaping that they're doing, or whatever. There you go. And so you're in this ultra paradoxical situation where the thing that you're buying is more expensive because of things that you're not even trying to buy. <laughs> and if you don't get the job that you're hoping for out of it, you still have to pay regardless. You can't get out of it even if you go bankrupt. And so now we're being backdoored into a form of indentured servitude where the debt actually can't ever be forgiven or relinquished. Uh, I actually put it a different way. I think if people don't think differently about taking debt for college, then there's something wrong. You know, I, I'm not saying that the, the Peter Thiel, you know, college is useless philosophy is right. But I do think that we have definitely reached a point where the model that we have is no longer sustainable. And not just because of the trillion dollars of debt but because of the dynamics associated with both employment and, frankly, the debt. I think we all feel like the education system in this country is failing desperately. Is there something that can give us hope 
obviously you all give us hope, all the work that you're doing, but if you look into the school system itself, you know, what are the bright lights, the solutions that you see that are working? Lighting round. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, 10 seconds or less. Okay, um, yeah. so... Um, uh, That's our last question, we really do have to wrap up. Actually, oh, all, right, so we, all right, so we are lightning round. Um, so uh, I'm on the board of Success Academy. Success mm -hmm. Academy is working. Um, and, uh, but discreetly, I think the point of Success Academy mm -hmm. is that Success Academy proves that in places that people thought were educational deserts, there is a ton of talent. And uh, like a lot of really amazing black and Hispanic kids who come from not the best families, who have all the God-given potential in the world. They just need the right people and the right leaders in front of them. Um, so that just um, incidentally is uh, something I think that's going well. So what's working? Uh, Lightning round. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's working? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll pass. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Since I've worked we want to hear. Um, if you go to teach.org, do I have a thing with the microphone? Yeah, no, it's good. It's working. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teach.org and also follow us on Twitter, Teach. Um, our first three films were actually a trial exhibit in the Vergara versus California case, mm -hmm. which would at last bring some common sense to tenure, seniority, lockstep pay. Um, and our film, Thank you. It's probably the greatest milestone in some ways because it's concrete and it went through the courts because it's an unjust situation when kids never are put as a priority in schools. That's incredible. Um, and New York is looking at that too. I cannot talk about the New York case as much. I'm sure um, uh, Jarrell can tell you more later working here. Yeah, I can explain it to you. But that, I mean, that is one thing. And it's not anti-teacher to say that every teacher should love their job and be there and love their students, mm -hmm. and that the school should be a place of joy, and that when you are working hard as a teacher, everyone else around you should be as well. And it's teachers in our film, The Flame Game, public school teachers who tell it best. So please watch that film um, and pay attention to those cases, because I think they are going to change some things. I think that there's some very interesting models, especially in charter schools. Uh, the challenge is that they are not widely dispersed, but I think whether it's Success Academy, Village Academy, KIPP, mm -hmm. there are some examples out there of people who have found a way to change the model and get better outcomes. I also think that there are people who work on the not-for-profit side who've been able to do after-school programs, extra-school programs, and other things to enhance and support and supplement the education that people are getting in schools whether it's what SEO has now moved into high school and helped kids do there, uh, whether it's what the Capers have done with their Smash Academies, uh, there's a number of people who have actually done a phenomenal job of not only taking kids out of these dropout factories, but getting them into college at extremely high rates, and even getting them into the best colleges in the world. Can I, is Kimberly, did Kimberly, did you have a question? Okay. Is Kimberly here? Yeah, I thought I saw um, so thank you to, I mean, this was a fantastic panel, and thank you yeah. for all your questions, but thank you for coming, and thank you for being part of the discussion tonight, and for all the work that you're doing, most importantly. Thank you. Thank you.